Boss fights are, in my opinion, the pinnacle moments of any good RPG. In my recent hands-on experience with Path of Exile 2, I got to see just how terrifying, brutal and incredible boss fights in this game are going to be. The boss design is next level, and even Act 1's bosses blow most of Path of Exile 1's bosses away. Each one of them feels different and engaging, with deep mechanics, a ton of different skills and some very awesome aesthetics. They are terrifying, frustrating, but also a thrill and extremely rewarding to overcome. So here's a look at each of the boss fights I was able to encounter in Act 1 of Path of Exile 2. This first fight is the Bloated Miller. This game's Hillock. The tutorial fight and the guy who teaches you how to dodge roll. You'll get tutorial pause and pop-ups here to flask if you go live on life on mana and to dodge roll if you're about to get hit by his large slam attack. Notice that he has a red flash before his slam. That denotes an unblockable attack which must be dodged or sidestepped. You also get to first see boss staggers here, stuns that build up on the bar below their health and when it's full the boss goes into a stagger animation. Each of these animations is unique to each boss and they have different durations. A well timed stagger can interrupt one of their big attacks, give you some good chance to deal some damage or a bit of time to get away. Brilliantly, this little fight here is bound to not one-shot you, but if you consistently get hit by the slams, you'll run out of flasks and go down. A perfect intro to the game's boss fights. Slow and lumbering, always forced, quick and deadly. Nice, waking snow, sleep my pretties as invader. Right outside of town is the Carrion Crone, the game's first optional zone boss. These are scattered around and drop permanent character buffs when killed, so they're a big incentive to explore and hunt them down. This boss definitely calls back to Hailrake from Path of Exile 1 I think. She reanimates wolf corpses and has several ice themed spells with very good signalling. She tends to hide in her ritual site, tempting you in there where she's much more dangerous, but there's plenty of room to duck out and play it safe if needed. I almost feel like this boss is lulling you into a false sense of security for the one that comes next. When you take her out, she drops the head of the Winter Wolf, which gives 10% cold resistance when eaten. I guess you eat it. The next boss is the infamous Devourer. It's awesome that the classic monster which terrorised early Path of Exile 1 players is given such a loving homage here in Path of Exile 2. This fight exemplifies the idea that GGG lead producer Jonathan explained previously with their boss fight design. That's that they want most bosses to kill a player two or three times before they come back and beat it. This is likely the time where you will first experience that as a part of Exile 2 player. The Devourer is a very tough, but also very fair fight. Its basic melee and ranged attacks are fairly manageable with simple sidestepping, even allowing you to maintain damage on the Ranger while doing so. It also has a very well signalled burrowed attack and tail slams to navigate. 
but all of these abilities are just designed to put pressure on the player to stress their flasks and distract them from the real threat, the poison breath. This is the only mechanic that must truly be mastered in order to succeed at this fight. And once you realise that, you'll find that it's actually pretty straightforward to do so. You actually have three options. Stay close to the Devourer and rotate around the boss quicker than it can turn. Hide behind its own body to block the breath. Or dodge roll through slash under the breath. This is the first challenge wall that players will likely get stuck at. And I think GGD designed it to be so, to really drive home the idea that players may not proceed until they show that they can recognise and adapt to boss mechanics. While it will always be possible to out-level and out-gear bosses, the Devourer cleverly is placed before the player has had really any chance to grow in power. You might only be level 2 or 3 by the time you get here. Again, I think this is intentional, driving home the idea that Path of Exile 2 boss fights have some mechanical depth to them. And to succeed, it's going to take you some skill development. This design led to me feeling very satisfied when I finally mastered its mechanics and came away with the win after more than a couple deaths. Check out that little cursor spin of joy when I finally take it down. The next minor boss is the Rust King. After collecting several runes of power from an ancient Ezemite battlefield, rusted weapons and armour animate with elemental energies to become an ancient warlord reborn. This boss comes after you feeling like the Terminator, keeping up the pressure and forcing you to navigate the other monsters on the battlefield, kind of using the terrain here really. I'd recommend clearing the area first on hardcore so you don't get surrounded too easily. It's interesting to see how different the movement and aggression levels on different bosses are. Some are much more stationary, others come right at you, and others are dodging around a lot. It really changes things up. And it gives different builds a chance to shine. Some builds will do better at some bosses that are more or less aggressive in the way that they move around. The Rust King here uses a variety of elementally infused metal magic attacks and occasionally calls for reinforcements in a circle to try and trap you. Builds that struggle with adds might quickly find themselves overwhelmed. In particular, I love the menacing sound effects this guy has for his attacks. I ended up having some really close fights with this guy. So close, in fact, that we end up with a mutual kill. Draven the Eternal Praetor is a part of a major side quest that includes a total of three bosses, each that are similar but distinct. I was a little unprepared for Draven when I first ran into him, and he ends up forcing me to portal for a refresh. Remember here that flasks are much more limited in Path of Exile 2, and bosses designed to defeat you through attrition most of the time. The idea is that if you want to refresh to get back to full strength, then you must take the risky action of casting a portal, which leaves you quite vulnerable. It can be kind of exciting to just barely manage to escape in time though, so I kind of get what they're going for here. Notice that at some point he'll actually call from aid from a ghostly companion. We'll get to see her again later. Something I didn't realise or take advantage of in this fight, which led to it going on a bit longer, is that you're actually supposed to step on the spirits to prevent him from absorbing them. It appears that they empower him, allowing for that swiping projectile attack that's quite hard to dodge. I initially thought that the spirits would hurt me, so I actively avoided them, but it's pretty clear from the footage that you're supposed to step on them. Taking advantage of that, I imagine, would simplify the fight quite a bit. I have 
no idea who you were, Praetor. And frankly, I don't care. The next boss in this quest is Asinia, Praetor Consort, Draven's partner it seems. Who dares tread these halls? Same theme, but entirely different fight. In addition to her basic attack combo, she has a bone cone and a large pulsing circle attack. I imagine that last explosion is probably close to a one-shot if not a one-shot. Like Draven, she also absorbs spirits, though this time to launch a spirit bomb mortar that's a bit easier to avoid. Her scariest attack is a bone prison that you have to escape. Some parts will fall down that you can run through. If you fail to escape it, it allows her to bombard you with a very focused attack for a pretty likely death. If you do manage to escape the bone prison, she instead flings the bombard attack over a large area in frustration. It's a lot less concentrated and deadly this way. A cool detail. She'll also call the spirit of Draven to aid her as well, who will use his signature projectile slash for less damage this time though. I just narrowly managed to escape one last bone prison to just barely eke out the victory here. I will not such I require your aid, Raven. We will be together once Let more. Let the cycle of life and death return to its course. At the end of this quest, delivering some bad news reveals that Lachlan is the third and final boss. My family. They are calling my... My when he reveals the deception, he gets a real cheap shot off on you at the start of the fight. He is the simplest of the three bosses, but not less deadly because of it. He hits like a truck with a combination strike from his mutated flail arm. It looked truly brutal the way he slapped me around there. In addition to some menacing basic attacks, he'll call spirits to use as projectiles and mortars. He'll also stomp the ground occasionally, releasing a spirit to spiral after you before it slams into the ground. Something clever about this guy is that so far most bosses have encouraged you to dodge their attacks by dodge rolling behind them. It's a classic strategy in these games. This guy turns that on its head with a double slam in front and behind him to force you to change up your tactics if you've been leaning on that trick a bit too much. The developers are being a bit cheeky here. This is why I live alone. Family brings nothing but pain. They've all gone mad! Don't do this. Stop. Just wait! Surely, surely we can- No! We won't escape again! Great Wolf, take you bastard! The Executioner has one of the best intros to a boss fight I've seen in a while. Haunting. And he's a big scary dude as well to back it up. With his oversized axe, he delivers some pretty meaty chops. And notice that they'll actually track you for a bit before they go off, so if you dodge roll or sidestep too early, you'll still get hit. You have to wait to the last moment, which is a good lesson to be learned here. I end up getting hit a lot with this attack to really drive this lesson home. Sometimes I need to be taught the same lesson over and over again. He has a combo leap slam into back slam, another skill designed to mess with players' movement and kind of just like default behaviors to force you to pay attention effectively. If you dodge under his leap slam, he'll get you with the back slam. So you gotta change it up and sidestep instead. In addition to that, he's got a large charge up fire slam and the ability to call down a guillotine, which is probably a kill move. The guillotine I didn't stick around to find out. You made the 
death, but unlike me, you couldn't escape it. Next up we have a side boss some of you may recognise. Candlemass was designed for Path of Exile 2 initially and then backported into Path of Exile 1 as a Sanctum Floor boss. Here here's an optional zone boss that you can hunt down for a HP boost. The Melted Candle Demon design remains very cool and he boasts some meaty fire breath, Mortar Barrage and some fiery melee strikes. His attack pattern and more stationary nature makes him an excellent target for Ranger's escape shot, using it to leap over him and build up freezes. That said you have to be wary of his variant Mortar that also fires behind him. As he gets to low life he'll also passively mortar little projectiles at a distance. The key to this fight actually is to stay very close to him. And to cap off an act of amazing bosses we have Act 1's pinnacle fight, the Iron Count, the man who sentenced our character to death. He's here to make good on his promise. Run, little no this is an impressive end of act boss with a lot going on. Initially he's a rather threatening duelist sporting a cold enchanted greatsword. His agile spinning attack combos are not to be underestimated. He also has a stabbing attack that shoots a shard of ice with a high freeze chance and duration. Thankfully rather easy to dodge with a good wind up. He also has a charge attack with a large AoE backswing designed to attrition the player. You really have to get right away from him when he does this or actually stay close to him to avoid it, which is a tricky thing to adapt to tactically. His coup de gras is an overhead attack that creates two ice walls to imprison the player before striking with a slam. This is cleverly designed to maintain the pace of the fight. If you escape he does the slam quickly and the fight resumes, so you don't have to wait around before things get exciting again. But get caught and he takes longer to slam actually giving you a bit of a chance to destroy the walls and escape. Or you can try to dodge past him which is easier the closer you are so melee players get a bit of an advantage here, clever design. Pretty early on he also showcases a wolf form where he plants his sword to shift into wolf mode. His cold abilities come from his sword so he becomes pure physical during this while the sword actually spreads a frozen ground effect from its magic seeping into the floor that you will slip over on and become frozen if you walk over. During his wolf form he'll use a charge that pops blood bubbles perpendicular to his path. Make sure to get behind him to avoid this. If you end up running alongside of him you're going to get hit by them. He'll sometimes summon werewolves as well and if they get hit by his blood attacks they'll actually overload and explode. Such a cool detail. He'll also use a meteor slam that's got good signaling but a pretty tight timing. If you're close to him you'll see him fade out and you can be more ready for the attack but if you are kind of far away from him, maybe you're playing at range, then you might be left only seeing the shorter slam marker on the ground which has a much shorter lead time and making it a harder thing to dodge. Again pretty clever stuff. Run, no, it's Open the cage. 
Release the beast! Give me what you promised! Yuri! You manipulative whore! How dare you abandon me! After all I've given you! When he starts to lose the fight, he'll beseech his partner for aid, but when betrayed, he mutates into a hybrid werewolf that can still use his ice sword this time. This blends the fight into a partial version of the werewolf and the sword version with some new stuff to boot. There's a fog phase here with adds and some terrifying lunge attacks. It really makes you feel like prey during this portion of the fight. Very cool. you will also use a combination of blood and cold magic attacks here, some directly and some passively as he attacks you in melee. This phase is really fun to manage as a ranger as you weave through the orbital strikes while keeping up the fire. It's an incredible fire with so much going on. Every time I rewatch the footage I discover some nuance. There's so many different abilities and some really cleverly designed mechanics here. Also impressively, it's a very fair feeling fight too, with it being very well balanced to attrition the player rather than just one shot them with cheap tricks. I really should have had a harder time with this fight, but the ranger had access to some really good flush charge regeneration, which helped me stay in the fight despite getting hit way too much by basically everything. With tighter balancing on the player side of things, then that attrition aspect of the fight is going to play a much bigger role I think. That said, it was still a really tough fight and I was holding my breath for quite a long time at the end and ended up shaking and cheering when I finished the fight. Just an awesome experience overall. The past continues to influence the present. And there you have it, a look at some and not even all of the planned bosses of just the first act of the game. You cannot even compare it to the first act of Path of Exile 1's bosses, it's just night and day. And in general it's just way beyond what I expect from the intro portion of any RPG. If I gave up this level of pace and quality for the full six act campaign then it's going to be a pretty phenomenal experience for fans of great boss fights like myself. Hope you enjoyed this early hands-on look at the game. I'm Ziggy D, and thanks for watching.